Okay. We're and officially we're back. <laughs> Are we? Mentally? Hey. Maybe not. Yeah, we're we're sipping on some coffees right now because yeah, it's been it's been a time. It has been a it time. It's been a time. We will fill you in as to exactly why and where we've been for a few what? weeks. <laughs> uh yeah, who, what, when, where, why. It actually feels like we've not done this in months. So I'm That's I'm pretty excited like, about been, being back. I'm excited being back. It's it's we have like a lot of stuff that are off our shoulders now. So I feel like it's refreshing. We're coming back to it fresh ish. Ish. We're recovering. <laughs> this week maybe is not the freshest, but you know, from from here on out it gets better. It's a yeah, steady climb. Yeah. We kind of just dropped off the face of the universe, and there are many reasons for that. So. Yeah, one well in the last one we did discuss how we may not post every week because of our thesis. Yeah, we just we had to get that done. And unfortunately a lot of energy went towards that. So we just had to pull the plug for a little bit and take a little break because then we wouldn't I guess give the best. Like we Probably so not. I don't even know if it was drained. that. I think my my brain stopped working. Like it was just mm. You ever have thoughts that just never leave your head? Like you've just got this impending deadline that you know is coming mm. and you know you should be doing more about it and you don't and it just doesn't leave. That that was that for months. Yeah. So crunch time happened. It's all done. Happy days. Hand it in. Don't know if we've passed. We'll find out. Yeah. Well, that's fine as long as it's out of my head because <laughs> we finished it last week. So we submitted last Thursday. So it's been exactly a week of kind of freedom. So, we did have another assignment due today, but I finished that two weeks ago. Yeah, because you're a little nerd. I only got that in yesterday, but um, yeah, that's pretty good. 24 hours early. <laughs> but I just as a reminder for people, so part of part of the Masters in Sport and Exercise Psych that me and Sid uh, completing, uh, one of the requirements was we had to write a systematic review on essentially topic of our choice which is a systematic review is essentially just like a big synthesis and review of as much literature as we can find on that specific mm-hmm. topic. So um, I, mine was on the effectiveness of self-talk in athletes. Um, so I just did a nice little compilation of everything over the last 10 years. Uh, and mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll let Sid uh, run you through hers because I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. Yeah, I can't wait to hear about yours as well. Um, maybe next week. Uh, Because self-talk is such a massive topic as well. Um, I did how does athletic identity and involuntary retirement affect post-retirement outcomes in elite athletes? And when I mean, when I talk about post-retirement outcomes, I mean um, the mental health outcomes that uh, athletes face afterwards. Okay, so not whether they moved on to get a job or anything like that. It's more how they actually sort of coped with it afterwards. Is that right? Yeah, it's the various uh, mental health uh, issues that they face afterwards. Cool. That's how I kind of described it. I'm keen to learn about that. Yeah, it was very interesting, although I feel like, um, I don't know, it's such a large topic as well, but there's not as many um, papers out there about it, especially in elite mm. athletes for some reason. Well, is it, is it so, hard to, like, how do you kind of, yeah, even study it? Well, it is um a lot of qualitative data type thing. So meaning that it's a lot of personal experiences and then they're measuring or doing, you know, measuring anxiety, depression, life satisfaction uh, with scales. Yeah. Over a period of time. Yeah. And that, so yeah, so qualitative being that sort of interview type mm-hmm. approach to the, to the whole research like, piece. Yeah. It was like cross-sectional. Yeah. So there was like a interview, but also they did like, what's it called? Assessments, like questionnaires. Yeah. That's yeah. the word. Questionnaires. Yeah. Psychometrics and mm-hmm. yeah, cool. All right. I focused, I focused on purely injury and illness. Uh, so I didn't uh, focus on any retirement reasons that were related to age or lack of skill, things like that. So it was more sudden injuries. Right. So... So, so that's sort of like the involuntary side of the whole thing where it's all of a sudden, bang, no longer can continue. Got to pull the pin. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's like a few other reasons. Like, yeah, there are injuries that happen over a, a longer period of time and then your body just, you know, can't do what it can anymore. I feel like that that's also involuntary, but there's also a process that goes with that. Whereas I, I just wanted to focus on ones that were sudden. So what like when when you say sudden, what what do you yeah, what do you actually mean? What is sudden referring to? When I mean sudden, I mean uh they were in a competition or training and right. they hurt themselves, like whether it was an ACL or something like that. Yeah, and okay. They literally could not grow anymore. So how, how many but how many athletes would have done or or are you sort of referring to more like if I was you know, because a lot of athletes when they approach 30 are considered old for their sport. So it'd be like, I'm mm-hmm. maybe 30, right? And I'm and I'm really kind of in the last few years of high of high performance. And then I do an ACL. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. what we're referring to, right? Because it's like, well, geez, what am I going to do here? Like a year of rehab and try to come back at 31, 32. Yeah, well, I didn't put an age bracket on it. And I just like saw the different uh, responses and I think it was like the youngest was 21 and the oldest was like 46. Oh, well, okay. In the grand scheme of like, um, I think I had like 300 participants all up, which is not too bad. And those who um, retired younger, like in their early 20s, had a lot more difficulties uh, mentally mm. than those who, who retired from 30 above. Did that depend on the sport too? Uh, no, no. Right, okay. There's a whole range wow. of sports. And unfortunately, most of the sample uh, were males and a large portion of them were soccer players. Yep. A large portion. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, soccer, like male soccer players. So it was kind of hard in that regard to kind of pinpoint uh, the differences in sex and age and sport. Because Ooh. then some studies looked at like, multiple sports like 10 different sports skiing swimming like karate the list goes on and there was only like a couple in each of those groups yeah okay so the sa- the actual so sample was size thing. wasn't great yeah yeah, yeah. okay so there definitely needs more work around specific sports uh and also looking more into the female athletes was there was there any differentiation between t- uh, effects of team sport involvement versus individual my studies didn't go that deep. I didn't have that many studies to even look into that. Yeah, That's okay. The thing because I think there was there was one. Um, most studies had a range of sports, mm. and in each group it was like maybe two, three. It was really random, and then there was one big study with soccer players, and one big study study with uh, ice hockey players. I reckon the ice hockey guys would be prone to to some injuries. Given what, yeah. what they do and to each other. It was like, oh, well, yeah. They're all based around different countries, like Canada, Australia, UK, Slovenia, Slovenia, I said, <laughs> Russia. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so it was, it was really hard to, like, find kind of, like, some themes within that. Yeah. That's it's, what uh... I found, like, was a weak point of the whole thing. Definitely well, highlights if... that there needs to be more focus. Well, yeah, because I'm like I'm actually I'm thinking about it now. Like, why why wouldn't there have been a lot done on it? I'm assuming there would be over the next sort of ten to twenty years with like because there's been there's already been a, a, a bit of an uptick in mental well being and and mental health in sport. So I can only assume that people start to sort of catch on about the retirement side of things and and try to implement some stuff from here. Mm. But, what I found was because a lot of the studies they did include um, people who retired voluntarily and involuntarily, hmm. but the main focus was voluntarily. So I actually had to find and pull out that sample of involuntary participants, which was drastically small. Uh, sometimes I had to really look for it as well and do like some calculations in order to find it because the focus was just not there. Yeah. And there was a whole like massive sample of voluntarily uh, retired athletes. And we're not well, just talking me... about athletes. We're talking about elite athletes, like people who have played professionally. So there's heaps yeah. out there on like college and stuff, but that wasn't my focus. It's got me, it's got me thinking about um, would I classify my retirement from swimming as involuntary or voluntary? 
And it's like, did did anyone say it was sort of both? Uh, no, there was no category to like say both. It was just one yeah. or the other. It's it's what weird. Would you say yours was. Well, like, I how did it happen? It's weird, right? Because I so post surgery, lots of rehab. It was like nearly a year of rehab where I was sort of trying to get back into it and and do all the things. So I would say that that side of it was involuntary in in the sense that like of course i didn't want to get injured tried to fix it didn't work so then that side of it was like well what do i do but then i suppose i like i could have tried to keep going i suppose but voluntarily i was then like look this is probably not where it's at so yeah i don't know i feel like it's a little bit of both because you have to come to some level of acceptance towards the end of it anyway where it's like well this is this is just driving me insane trying to do this thing where it doesn't feel like I'm getting anywhere. So that's enough for now. I have another question for you. Oh, here we go. Uh, When that was happening, what was your athletic identity? Oh, swimmer. high, medium, Through and through. High, super high. Yeah? Yeah, Yeah, Mm. guaranteed. Because I looked looked at um, elite athletes who had a high athletic identity and then had to retire involuntarily and – those are the people that struggled the most. And then yeah. like those who were kind of like mm, maybe 32 and above had kind of like a moderate athletic identity. They found it a lot easier to transition out of the sport. It was still like not like they still had issues, but their life satisfaction was a lot better than those who had a high athletic identity and were younger uh, and, re- and retired due to injury. Did you find any, was there anything mentioned about the, the athletes that did uh, or that felt better about the whole thing were the ones who then replaced their athletic identity with a different identity? Was that mentioned at all? Um, that wasn't specifically mentioned, but it was more those who had another purpose in life. Yeah, okay, but purposes. Those, yeah, good way. Yeah, but those who had a strong athletic identity didn't really... I guess see themselves doing anything else because their athletic their identity was so tied into the sport that they didn't have anything else to go to or to you know um, so that that's why they struggled so much. So like to a kind of transition um, into their post sport life. Is that like a like a footy player who then goes into coaching, or yeah. is it like yeah yeah yeah, yeah in, into coaching or if they get onto like the TV commentating and things like that. So they're still yeah. staying within uh, within the environment because that's where all their social supports are. Or if they're a ex-swimmer who becomes a psychologist. <laughs> it's <laughs> just funny though because I've, I've literally got like, so two, two of my good friends that I used to swim with are now, one of them is a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, our colleague Justin is on track to become a sports <laughs> psychologist. We we all used to swim Shout together. Out. Actually, there's another one too that I just remembered as well. She's also a clean psych. Like it's it just must be. Uh, there's definitely a trend there with swimmers going into the psychology space. But um, it's one that was sort of all we've all ended up going full circle and coming back around after things. But um, yeah, I digress. <laughs> yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? And especially with elite um elite sports because you're in the limelight all the time. Even just not being in in that environment anymore can affect you. So they go into um, public speaking and. Oh yeah. But I, I think like also I was, I was listening to a thing the other day with, um, with uh, Shaq, he was, he was doing some random podcast yeah. and they're like, why do you do DJing at massive shows? And he's like, I don't do it for any other reason than to just feel the thrill of being up on, on the stage. Cause he said, it's the closest mm-hmm. thing he's felt to when he was playing basketball was being in front of that many people sort of controlling the crowd and doing things like that. I thought it was a cool reflection on that exactly. because it's like, how do you, how do you get that feeling again? And I think that's a big part of this. It's like that rush. It's nothing will ever compare to being in a stadium or, or you know, on the field with hundreds of thousands of people and uh, chanting you or seeing you in the street and be like, Oh my God, like, can I get a photo? Or <laughs> You know, it's like such a rush and especially if you're if you're good at what you do and you love and you're passionate. So then for you to get a career ending injury out of nowhere, um, that is 
confronting because you lose a lot of this, especially with team sports, you know, the coaches, your teammates, you know, that, all that support. I guess people, uh, athletes f- uh, afraid of becoming irrelevant as well. Mm. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but there are a lot of athletes that do still study at the same time if that sport allows them to, if there's enough time. Otherwise, they've been, like, doing this since they're, like, you know, young, like, children training so much every day like this. There's no other option. Like, I'm going to be, you know, this or this. Uh, And then at 22 years old, you get an injury that would mess with your head in many ways. So a lot of the results I, I got from, like, the mental health outcomes was higher or increase in depression, anxiety, stress, uh, low life satisfaction, low self-esteem. Those were the main ones. Those were the main big ones. Sort of the guys that you imagine sitting, sitting at the pub, you know, every night of the week, sinking beers, telling, telling the stories of the glory days when they were 17 and we're going to be massive. And then all of a sudden it's not happened anymore. Mm Um, Mm -hmm. that's sort of what comes to mind when I think of that yeah it makes me think of the Beckham documentary actually on Netflix have you Mm -hmm. watched it I haven't I I need to but I've heard that I'd be super super interested in it you definitely would it's it's pretty cool I know I haven't had time to get around to it but yeah from what I've heard and the bits and pieces I've ever seen it's just it's right up my alley (laughs) Yeah, well, all right. Well, we'll go and watch it, and then we'll revisit this <laughs> in another in another right. episode because uh, I reckon you'd have a bunch of things that you'd want to unpack with that because it's cool. It's a massive topic, and I feel like it's it's pretty like it's brushed under the rug a lot of the times. Like people don't realize that the struggles of retirement, especially in athletes, they're like, oh yeah, they retire, like whatever, like <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I think it's Whenever it's I like explain- the. Well, you have you have the, the ones that are at the absolute peak, right? So, you know, your Beckhams and your Ronaldos and like all those soccer boys, all the really good AFL boys, like anyone that you can think of, good swimmers, whoever, who have made the absolute peak of of their sport, that they're, they're kind of the ones that come to mind, right? Where it's like, well, oh, mm-hmm. they're retired, but you know, they made heaps of money and they were super famous and they lived this like crazy life for a few years, even longer that's kind of how we think of it. It's like, oh, poor you, right? But then mm. you've got everyone else underneath that whose whose dreams were crushed just short of making it or never even had a chance. Like there'd be millions of people in that in that list. So it's it's interesting that our brain will automatically go to like how lucky were they or how fortunate were they to even have that experience. So, you know, just deal with it, right? You got all the you got all the good stuff. Just deal. Whereas mm-hmm everyone else who didn't quite make it there's this there's almost like this misunderstanding that comes with how much effort it actually takes to even get close to that level and then every now and then someone makes it over that threshold and everyone kind of goes that's that's where it's at for everybody it's not like that at all yeah well there's always there's always someone better than you at the same time so you're always fighting for something and even when you're the best like you can get kicked off that real quick and take long (laughs) like it just takes that (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, and then you have like the the people that, um, I guess the general population that abuse those athletes for making mistakes or or things like that. And it's like you get on the field, <laughs> see how hard it is. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm sure they make, make mistakes every day, but yeah, I think I'm going off topic a little bit, but I think that's what I what I heard from like the Bucket Beckham uh documentary oh some of the stuff that he had to go through was putrid Mm. yeah Mm -hmm. it was horrid i don't know how he did it really it was crazy it's crazy to watch and and hear about so anyway we'll uh we we do we do digress today because uh we're just getting getting the train back on the tracks so yeah we can we can steer you back back towards uh what we need to talk about yeah, we are we are a little bit rusty. Well, I know I am anyway. There's just been so much going on in life. So now I'm just at the point where I'm just trying to get life back together a little bit. So apologize. <laughs> apologies if I just seem so out of whack, but we'll get there. We'll be fine. It's all right. We both are. So that's good because we gave a little disclaimer at the start. So no one's expecting five stars from today. 
<laughs> we're giving you we're giving you what we've been working on and if we sound a little bit fried that's there's a good reason for that so deal with it yeah and thank you to whoever has stuck around still Love <laughs> yeah you. Whoever, whoever's still hanging in there appreciate you we're proud of you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it. it was it was good to kind of like unpack my thesis properly I know we've spoken about it here and there uh uh, hopefully it was enough but I'm looking forward to hearing about yours because yours is a big because self-talk is yeah it's quite a big topic it's been around for a while there's been lots of studies on it so I'll be oh I'm looking forward to, to hearing what what you've found well we'll put it together for for next week and we can mm-hmm. we can get it smacking um because it's yeah it is quite an interesting topic I've liked I've enjoyed presenting on my findings at work as well. There's there's a certain um, there's a certain level of comfort in knowing that. So in the psychology space, we're very big on what does the evidence say. So as mm. as a you know just Joe Bloggs mental health rah rah kind of person, there's no evidence behind a lot of what they say. So you know they just heard it on TikTok yeah. somewhere and oh yeah that's cool. As a psychologist, yeah. we're like what does the evidence say, and then we apply that. And this is, it's really nice to yeah. sort of go, right, I've compiled 10 years worth of research on one very specific topic. Now I know this is what it says. How do we then apply that yeah. in, in the space? So it's, it's really cool to, um, yeah, to sort of have that understanding and, and, and know that what I am sort of, I suppose, passing on to, to athletes and coaches and, you know, businesses, whatever, is sort of the best knowledge that we have at the moment in that space and it's it's like anything like it's always going to sort of change and evolve but yeah it's a it's a nice feeling so i try to pass it on that's why systematic reviews are so useful Mm. because it kind of collates everything together and it tells you the positives and negatives like everything so you can what am i trying to say (laughs) it's more it's more streamlined in its approach essentially i think that's what you were trying to say yeah in a way (laughs) In a way, <laughs> yeah. I was like, "Oh man, we're, our brains are our brains are not used to the uh, the endurance podcast at the moment. We need to. <laughs> I think we need to wind this up for now, and we'll and we'll kick this off again next week." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, thank you everyone for listening to this. <laughs> we, <laughs> we really tried. <laughs> it's good. We're back. We blew we blew the cobwebs out. If you hung around for the whole episode, you're a legend. And uh yeah, we will we'll chat to you again next week. We'll about see self-talk. you next week. Self-talk, Thanks, self-talk, self-talk. See ya. <laughs> Peace out.